are now tuned in to the Two Minute Warning, a live stream community conversation pertaining to social and political issues and how we can collectively resolve them. Powered by the West Side Gazette. Good evening and welcome to the Two Minute Warning. <laughs> I'm David Wright. I'm sitting in for our illustrious host, Mr. Perry Busby. Unfortunately, our dear brother's under the weather tonight, so he's kind of thrown the realms over to um, oh, yeah. Perry and myself. Oh, yeah. Um, well wishes to you, my brother. Get well soon. Mm -hmm. Bobby, how are you feeling tonight? Sir? Well, you know me, man. I'm I'm terrific and getting better. I'm just digging this 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 whole vibe where we are tonight. So I'm I'm hanging in there, man. So share a little bit about where we at. Oh well, you know, uh, we're here at the old Dillard Museum, and um, as a matter of fact, it was the first school, colored school. Uh, here in Broward County. So we're here and um, um, it's a follow-up, if you will, a, a, a rollover, an overflow of what we did for the month of January when we talked about human trafficking. You know, so they had a live screening here tonight uh, of the movie, Taking Innocence, which was an offshoot. Of, uh, I like to say that we had a pivotal role in, in, that, in making that happen tonight as the community came out to uh, see the film, uh, the screening. Two of the, the the producer and the writer, they were on our show uh, last month, uh, Ms. Tamika Clark and uh, Ms. Nisi Johnson. And so they had a screening here in the auditorium of Walker Elementary, and we're live on the scene. We're live. Yeah, we're live. live. We're live. So a little bit about that screening. We have both had an opportunity to yeah. view it. Yeah. Um, <clears throat> You know, as tragic as, as this is, um, we, we know there's nothing new for, for people of our diaspora, people of, of melanin skin, that uh, we've seen this before. And uh, the fact that now it's it's still relevant to this day um, is, is, is heartbreaking. Yes, it is. Uh, to watch the video and to watch the screening, though, um, my heart just kind of went out. And uh, I know we as men, uh, we, we really have to do better when, when it comes to our conscience of uh, how we act in that arena when it comes to trafficking. Uh, some of the statistics that the yeah. movie talked about show that, that men are the primary culprit. We're the ones engaged. We're the ones doing the trafficking. Mm -hmm. we're, we're the common denominator oh, yeah. in the whole equation. In the whole equation. Uh, hopefully we'll have a couple of guests stop by uh, who actually saw the screening and one in particular who was in the movie. Uh, so that's is that. But David, you bring up a, a very interesting point. Uh, and, 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 and I asked that question when we doing the doing our, our show uh, what was the mentality uh, had there been is there is there a profile that that we can we can look at to say well you know the capabilities of this person is of such and, and, and unfortunately we don't uh, but like you said the, the majority of the participants on the afflicting the pain part, the majority of them are men. Yes, yes, the majority are. Um, so much of it, I, I believe, is, is just men succumbing to their flesh. But we do know that, again, this is nothing new. Mm -hmm. um, so if this has been something that has been passed down over the years, mm -hmm. centuries and centuries, even before our time, um, that this type of trafficking and abuse on human flesh has been taking place, uh, then we have to know there's nothing new under the sun. But at the same time, how do we uh, educate our young people to be what could be considered traffic proof? Now, there was another screening yeah. of a, yeah, a, a cartoon kids movie. children, yes. kids movie, mm -hmm. to help them understand how to become traffic proof. Okay, let's see, let's see if, you, if, if you paid attention. Uh, well, there was a quiz. Yeah, it was a quiz. And there were some young kids that <laughs> yeah, actually that won, answered the quiz. Yeah, answer them. yeah. So, there's always a target. There's a target. 
right? And, yes, and and, 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 and there's somebody in between now. I call them your snakehead, but, but that's, that's yeah, that's, that's the, the, the trick. The trick. They're trying to. They're gonna target you. They're trick gonna you. trick you, and then they're gonna trap you, and then they're gonna trap, and they got you. They got you. So there's a there's a screening out there for our mm-hmm. young kids too, and that's called traffic proof and that's done by the elite foundation and uh i thought it was very intriguing i learned a lot oh, yeah. even as an adult mm-hmm. uh, on the target the tr- tricking the trick we knew about yeah but the, and then the, the, the uh the trap the trap yeah and 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 and, and parents and, and and adults period if if you suspect if your your gut if your gut instinct is saying something is going on with it with that child follow up on it you know uh we would be surprised just how how frequent uh, this is taking place and, and, and just where it's taking place. There was another number that was thrown out tonight. Here in Broward County alone, there, there's about 40 missing children right now. Right now. That they believe is, is in that, that uh, mm-hmm. tricking, trapping, and targeting. Yes. And tonight there were 40 blue lights that were set up yeah. in empty seats to correlate with those 40 missing children Mm -hmm. right here in Broward County. Mm -hmm. Y'all, this is home. This is our front and back Mm -hmm. yard. Mm -hmm. And we have missing children right here that are not accounted for. And it's important that we do something about it. Say something, see something, something, say say something. something. when children start not showing up in school or having new sneakers on and got new gear, and you know they you know they don't have a job or have any funds to get that stuff. Yeah, they're being compromised. Mm. They're being sold into a, a, a program, and mm. and even though it may seem like it's their consent, if they're a minor, there's no mm-hmm. such thing as giving a consent to being trapped. Nope, not at all. Yeah, yeah that's another thing. So a lot yeah. of good information came out of the screenings tonight, and uh, if you haven't seen them or you want to know more about them, please go online. Yeah, look into. Taking Innocence Project, mm-hmm. A Man's World. There are four parts to that. We saw the one part tonight. And Traffic Proof by the Elite Foundation. Absolutely. Yes, yes, yes. And some heck of a presenters, too. Oh, yes. Oh, yeah. yeah. So. And I know they're all tied up in there uh, with with the answering questions. We invited the entire community out. So the community is there, and they're asking questions and getting all the information they can in reference to this trafficking uh, information. Mm-hmm. But uh, again, They'll be joining us in here shortly. Sure, sure. Well, well, well since we're here, right, in this building, in, in this this office, in this historic place, why don't we bring on um, the gentleman who uh, actually gives tours in here? Uh, he's a product of Broward County, and he knows a hell of a lot about Broward County. Even though he comes from the south end, he knows everything from the south to the north and everything in between. And he's a young brother. Young brother. A young brother. Deep brother. Deep brother. So, so yeah, let's let's do that. Yeah, let's let's go. bring him on while we wait. I'm gonna give you the honor. Okay. So I I I, I take this as a uh, um a point, a privilege point, a point of privilege uh, for me to introduce this young man uh, because of his knowledge and the fact that he is recording history himself. You know, I'm a publisher, but he is a recorder and collector of history, and he shares it with audiences on a daily basis. Uh, so without further ado, let me bring on Mr. Emmanuel George, the curator and uh, overseer of here, of the Old Dillon Museum. Come on, let me, let, me, let me see if I can change seats with you. Let me change seats. Come on. Come on. Come on. You come, come on. on. You, you, you are a guest of honor. Yes, you sir. Right here. Okay. Yes. Yes. No 
going on? Yeah. We're in your house. We're in your house. <laughs> right, I mean, yeah. You know, I mean, I, I mean, we can say that. It's also your house, too. Yes, yes, so, yes. Yeah. I'm going to be acting all bashful. <laughs> Come on, man. <laughs> mm -hmm. yeah. Thank you. I'm, I'm thankful for being here. Yeah. yeah. So, Mr. Henry did that eloquent introduction, but uh, again, I want to I want to expound a little more about your background because mm -hmm. he could not give you all the due diligence and <laughs> everything that you've done. So, mm -hmm. if you can, just kind of give us in our listening and viewing audience a little backdrop of who you are and what you do on a daily basis. Okay, no problem. Well, I mean, you know, uh, my name is Emmanuel George. I'm from Hollywood, Florida. You know, that's that's the, the addicts territory. Mm -hmm. You know, when you look at Broward County, I, I also look at it like from the territory, depending if you're in the south, central, or north. So, you know, I'm from the addict side, and um, I'm just real passionate about preserving history. And I started this uh, as a hobby in 2016, but I became really official in 2021 when I started my own archive collection at the African American Research Library, and then I also started my own 501c3 nonprofit called the Black Orchid Foundation, which is centered around preserving black history and around specific themes. So, like, my passion is documenting black high schools that were phased out, you know, um, via integration. And, you know, and through the Black Orchid Foundation, we're aiming to be able to get more young black people into preserving black history. And so we can have more uh, archivists in the community. According to Zipia, we're only about 5% of the archivist population. So when we hear about the lack of representation and the, the lack of stories or, you know, why are we not shown in a certain way? Because there's not many of us out there reaching out to get it, you know, to document and preserve this history. So I want to be able to get more young black people into archiving and document their history. Because I'm 30. I'm oh, sorry, because I'm 34 years old. And, you know, we need to have uh, more younger black people, you know, to be able to break that record for because I'm currently the youngest archivist in the county. But I want us to be able to see more younger black people involved. OK, OK. You know, you, you had a classroom full of uh, 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 perhaps some some possible young, young archivists, if you will. So, yeah. Yeah. Uh, Thank you. Yeah, we got to, um, you know, get more of us, you know, because um, right now in our county, it's a lot of BSUs popping up, you know, black student unions. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And it's really vital to uh, be able to, because these young students are mobilized. Like, they really want to get involved, you know, a lot of... <laughs> things are happening in the state of Florida politically, and they really want to be able to help and make a difference. So, you know, like th these young BSU students are very vital to the, the shape of our future, I feel. Absolutely. You know, we heard the first time uh, protests earlier today at yeah. Uh, FIU. Yeah, there was like a walkout or something like that. I yeah. believe that was um, Dream Defenders were doing yeah. some good. Well, our young people have to be yeah. engaged. They have to be involved, and I think you're instrumental in assisting in that. Oh, thank you. <laughs> yeah, I mean, it's all about bridging the gap, you know, because I wouldn't be able to have to be here if it wasn't for you know the OGs like yourselves mm -hmm. you know to, to take time to you know sit down and allow me to talk to y'all you know I mean it, it, I feel as if it's really crucial for us to be able to bridge the gap between the elders and the youth because this is vital for us to be able to move forward you know with with gentrification that's happening it's pushing us out cost of living is pushing us out a lot of our elders are getting older so they're leaving us so it's really vital for us to really document and preserve our history right now man you hit me in the gut you said when you said OG, I immediately went to to Unc, mm -hmm. Chris yeah. Priester, man. That, that, oh yeah, yeah rest in peace, man. man. God yeah, bless yeah, his soul. Man, rest in peace. That mm -hmm. again, that's that's here we go. That's, that's How do we get here? Yeah, you know, yeah. that's it's all it's all a part of that, man. It's all it's all a part of that. Mm -hmm. So so Emmanuel, if 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 you were to take a page out of history, uh, how did we get here? Oh man, we speak we speak it on Broward County. I mean, I mean, there's many different layers. You know, um, I always feel as if you know, maybe I'm a bit biased, but I feel as if the education aspect is what is what lead, led us here. You know, when we look at what was happening in the late '60s and 1970s. 1968 was the last year of Addicts High School, um, being in high school before it was downgraded to middle school. 1970, Blanche Ely closed for a few years. Dillard always remained. You know, that's a beautiful thing about Dillard, and I. I 
would say that dealer is the mecca. Um, but you know, I would just see like like those changes. Like that was when things started to like shift differently. And that's according to many of the elders I've interviewed. They always speak about like you know when integration happened, and um, whether one agrees with it or not. You know, I'm not here to take a side on it, but just speaking on the the history. Like we lost a lot um, after the integration happened here. Mm-hmm. All right. So listen. I hear you have a colleague that's always going to also going to be on this show. Somebody who yeah. works closely with you guys here at the old gentleman. Oh yeah, yeah, Miss uh, Marion Williams. Yes, yeah. So without any further ado, I just want to tell you all a little bit about this lady. Mm-hmm. I had the opportunity and the privilege to be in her presence a couple of days ago, and I can tell you, I was spellbound. I was just mesmerized by her fluency in speaking about the history right here in Fort Lauderdale and being a dealer of alumni and what it all meant to her. So without any further ado, can we bring Ms. Marion Williams on, please? Good evening, Ms. Williams. Well, good afternoon. Hello, hello. Mm-hmm. Did, did, uh, did, I, did I get that right? I think one of the most important things you have said is that I am a proud dealer alum. Okay. And that is why the history that we have is personal and immediate. Um, mm. I do work for Broward County Public Schools. Um, as a part of my um, duties, I work with students and teachers. And one of the amazing things that I find every time I do a workshop is how little our educators know about our true history here in Broward. Um, and I think that it's a travesty um, that the people who are educating our kids are not making the connections. And so we have been fortunate to do several trainings at Old Diller, um, be able to educate about our unique experience here in Broward. Um, and, it is, and it is a joy every day. Um, some of the things I do on my job is a task. This right here is a first love. Um, I worked with Ernestine Ray um, at that facility when I was in graduate school many years ago, um, when we were just collecting photos and documents. And now to walk back into the building, um, to see it in its full glory, it is a fantastic thing. Um, I do want to go back to the question that um, was posed, like how do we get here? You know, a lot of people in Broward, relocated here because they saw it as an opportunity. Um, My grandmother came from Georgia, um, was a sharecropper there, um, working only to earn credit and not to earn money. Um, Coming to South Florida, she continued to work, um, but then she was paid money. um, And that started our family well. And so a lot of times people don't know about that history. Um, Looking at Broward as an opportunity, sometimes we see a lot of the hurdles, but even through the hurdles, we were able to see progress. So again, I'm I'm glad to be here and I'm gonna allow you to lead the conversation and I'll be glad to give you whatever additional input. Okay, very good. <laughs> so, in that still realm of how do how do we get here, uh, we do know that a lot of our ancestors did migrate from Florida. We knew that former slaves um, mm-hmm. didn't always go north. Many of them came south, and they found safe haven here with our Indian brothers and sisters, our, our Native Americans, uh, Seminoles, and, and Miccosukees mm-hmm. here in Broward County. I I can remember my grandmother told him about uh, Indian Joe who used to come by oh, yeah. and used to bring the, the rabbits and all the good the, the stuff that they would catch out in the fields and, and bring it back to the neighborhood and, and sell it to folks that look like us. So um, it's amazing some of the histories and the old stories that you'll hear. Um, my great great uncle who drove a team of mules from Georgia down to Pompano because the mules got a day's work. And he got a day's work though. He wasn't leaving his mule. I mean, I mean, it's just the endurance, the the, the, the perseverance of our ancestors. Yeah. It's unbelievable. Yeah. Um, anything you want to add to that, uh, Mr. Man? 
Oh, man. I mean, you know, we could go on, you know, I mean, it was just like the migration. We also got to talk about the Bahamians, too. Oh, yeah. You know, the Bahamians, you know, from Key West all the way down to, Vero you know, up, up to Vero Beach, you know, I mean, if it wasn't for the Bahamians, there wouldn't even be a, a, a Miami, mm -hmm. you know, to incorporate Miami. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, um, that's another part, you know, to, Absolutely. to add yeah. as well. Yeah. Yeah. yeah I, I was listening to uh, <clears throat> Sister Audrey Peterman, and, you know, she, she had, when she talked talked about the uh, dry tortugas and 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 this this fort that was built out there right, in the middle of in the middle of water you know and 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 and, and how how the how blacks built that place built this this fortress this this beautiful edifice in the middle of the ocean basically mm -hmm. no fresh water they had to build cisterns and all all kind of stuff so yeah how did we get here how do we survive here? Absolutely. And, and Sister Williams, you mentioned some things to us um, so eloquently the other day uh, in reference to uh, our ancestors having property on the beach. Um, if you have beach stuff, you want to share a little more about that? I, I, I definitely want to um, key in on the fact that originally before Broward became a county, um, Blacks were able to live along the bleach of where I with our white counterparts. They were homesteading right amongst A one A. Um and so Broward is very unique when it comes to their laws of segregation. Um, unlike the South where the laws are already there and had to be overturned. Here in Broward, laws were put in place to create racial constructs. And so from living on the beach, homesteading that property, when Broward became a county, Blacks were forced to live in the Northwest Quadrant, right? They used intimate domain to force people off land that they had been living on. Unlike our white counterparts, who were able to keep their land along A1A over time and being used that as their family wealth, African Americans were stripped of that opportunity. And so when I share that with students and other adults, that yes, African Americans were required to live in a quadrant, in a zone, and that we were not free to live and move around this county, right? People marvel at that. They don't understand. They see Broward as it is today. Um, they don't realize how many lawsuits, how many protests, people like Ms. Eula Johnson, how Dr. Mizell, how just people in general had to continue to fight for some basic rights. Um, living five minutes on the beach, but couldn't go to Fort Lauderdale Beach. Understanding that there were hurdles, yet as a community, we continue to fight those battles. And I think that um, Emmanuel mentioned how um, he's researches and look at all of our tradition like high schools well when we're looking at that we cannot overlook um the the elites Blanche Ely and Doc, uh, and Professor Ely, they craft an education experience as a married couple. Um, they're able to um, work at Dewar, open addicts, and then also maintain Blanche Ely. And so you had a consistency within our community, you know, raising our kids to aspire to be more than what we are, preparing ways to move forward, even when they were doors that were being closed to us. Us. And so a lot of times our kids in our community right now is not making that connection. We have many people that don't even realize that addicts was in high school um, and that that also kind of disrupted their community. So when I say I'm a proud alumnus of Dillard, I am proud because of the legacy that we were able to fight and maintain, but I also know the struggles. Um, being that first person in my family to integrate schools, I saw our community carved up. Streets, some people went to Strandian, some people went to Piper B. Yeah, we all live right here together, but we were not able to go to school together. And so when we talk about why are we here, I, I do agree that sometimes what we perceive as progress are also other hurdles, right? Because as an intact community, 
we were able to work together, support each other. Um, people knew your parents, um, and so your teachers knew your parents. You went, you know, you're in the same community, and so you were able to kind of keep everything moving forward. Now there's a disconnect between school and home, um, and it's a very difficult conversation to say how do you rebuild that when our school system is so diverse um, and so. We do out at a time, one program at a time. Um, we try to push out and push in to let people know how being in South Florida, there was a lot of um, challenges that we had to face in order for people who are here now to be able to enjoy. And, and Ms. Williams, you brought on uh, several nice topics that I, I want to kind of bounce back and hit on because that quadrant, we all knew that was between the tracks. You, you mm -hmm. had to live between the mm -hmm. tracks. But there were some other things that impacted yeah. our education process too because when this school was founded, mm -hmm. They would close this school down during the it's summer right, and right. send you back to the fields That's to right. work. Mm -hmm. You wouldn't get 12 months of education. So, you know, there were some hurdles and there were some principles here that mm -hmm. actually fought mm -hmm. for them. And uh, when you speak of that quadrant, it was truly a village. And everybody of knew course. everybody and looked out for everybody. I mean, I could go next door and borrow a cup of sugar. Mama mm -hmm. said, go get some sugar some from, from this sugar behind us. And, 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 and that's what we were able to do. Everybody really looked out for each other. Yeah. Mr. Man, you want to share a little yeah, bit? Yeah, I was going to say, too, about, um, you, know, this, you know, from a researcher's perspective, because I wasn't there during that time. But, um, you know, also <laughs> the, the, the teachers, the, the principals, all lived in the community as well. Mm -hmm. So, you know, your, your, your teachers knew your parents. Your teachers were shopping in the same grocery stores that your parents and they were, were going to. They were going to the same churches that your parents were going to. So when they were and they were at the hair salon that your mom was going to. So you know mm -hmm. they, you were talking about you as well during these time periods. And um, just even studies are showing, statistically speaking, that like even though you know it was segregated and you know there was hand-me-down books and ripped up pages, black people were still prospering and still going to many HBCUs and creating an established establishing mm -hmm. uh, businesses during that time. So it wasn't always just like a negative thing where we were just going through hell and, and trials and tribulations. You know, we had a lot of things going. You know, you had the Windsor Club in Fort Lauderdale where you had like a lot of the mm -hmm. big stars to go to. In Hallandale, you had the, the Million Dollar Palms nightclub Palms where, you had, uh, the roof. Yeah, where you had uh, <laughs> Sam Cooke and Jackie <laughs> Wilson and um, Etta James and Marvin Gaye used to come to. So there was also another side of what was happening back then that was very beautiful as well. It wasn't just always torment and, and hell that they were going mm -hmm. through. Yeah. I, I want to do this if we can. I, I want to bring bring a, a guest from the uh, from the screen on. So let's see how we can can mesh this together. Okay. Uh, Lester, you want to join us? Can you come on and join us? Okay. His brother Lester Johnson. He um, very uh, uh, knowledgeable um, veteran, uh, retired from from BSO. Had an opportunity to uh, take a look at. The, the, the film tonight, and, and so if you could just um, share with us what you got from that from the film and, and you know, your perspective. Oh man, mm -hmm. you know, Bobby, I, I just don't understand how come uh, this topic of sexual trafficking is uh, not more broad mm -hmm. in our community today. Um, it's sad that we have to have someone in our family victimized in some kind of way before we start wanting to be involved or become a large voice. And um, I think that it should be something that definitely should be placed on the table at any of our community meetings, any type of political forums. It should really become a large topic because the less it's recognized, the more easier it would be to uh, accomplish trafficking some child or someone. And let's see, you, you, you first hand experience with perhaps some, uh, not only the victims, but, but the perpetrators, you know. Uh, how does that fit into uh, the, the psyche of, of, of a community and how we got here? Um, trafficking uh, in itself, wow. I mean, what, I mean, we probably get in trouble by sitting here and saying, hey, we left this field here ever since we were trafficked across the transatlantic. Mm -hmm. 
brought here. So now that spirit of human trafficking is now upon our country until we begin to make a dance with one another and come together with all heads of all nationalities, all ethnicities that sit on the table so that we could uh, stop this. Because I can tell you right now, from working in the Department of uh, Detention for 25 years, that uh, the sexual predators come in all colors. Mm -hmm. They don't care who they traffic. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So, 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 from 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 the screening of the movie, um, what was your take from that? Um, that uh, there are some people there uh, that were extremely passionate about uh, being a part of. Uh, stopping this sexual trafficking, that they'll do anything that it takes to to do their part and mm -hmm. being a uh, definitely a, a, a stop to this. Also, they're looking for hoping that more people join in in the system. So, you know, the more people helping, the, the faster they can put a stop to this atrocious yeah. activity that's going on. Now, now you, you're a part of the 33311. You, yes, you, you, so, so you, you know, you know how we got there. <laughs> yes, sir. Mm -hmm. Born and raised, born and raised on Six Trunk Boulevard. Mm -hmm. Yes, I was uh, 1969. I was born and raised right across the street from Mizell Funeral Home. Mm -hmm. There's an empty lot that sits there in between the store and what used to be King TV. Uh, our house mm -hmm. sat right down that lot at 1306 Northwest Sixth Street. The home was built in around 1946. Made out of something called Dade County Lumber. Mm -hmm. My great uncle, uh, who was a stripper, uh, mm -hmm. he was all also a World War One, uh, excuse me, World War Two veteran in the Navy mm -hmm. at the time when blacks could only be cooks and ship hands or deck hands on the ship. He was six foot four, mm -hmm. a very loving man. He took care of my mother and myself when I was just a, a little boy. Mm -hmm. I almost got killed in Sixth Street by, when I was about three years old. I, he, he was holding my hand. And he was so tall and I was so short and I got away from him and dodged out in the street. And uh, a car jammed on brakes, and there were some palm trees in the media. Mm -hmm. That car, in a void, in order to avoid hitting me, it struck a palm tree and said, I was standing in the middle of the road. Mm. What's that blue light for, brother? Yeah, I, I, you know, I didn't, I, I just had to bring this blue light, you know, yeah. because uh, since I heard about a blue light represented one of 40 children that are currently missing now here in Broward County, mm -hmm. just one county, we have 40 children who are missing, and this candle represents one of those mm -hmm. children that are missing, and I'm going to take this candle home, and, you know, I consider myself to already be an activist in my community, because if I see something wrong, and I, I think I mentioned one time, I said, I wonder if we can get a bunch of men to start just getting on their feet, their bicycles, or whatever, just start riding around these school zones in the mornings and afternoons, you know, when kids are going to school and out of school, because I do it sometimes, and I see children you know, just young, just walking by themselves, going to school, you know. And I don't judge their parents because people have to work. People do what they can to, to make ends meet. And sometimes the parent may have to go to work a lot earlier than the child has to go to school. And the child has to be responsible enough, like we used to call years ago, latchkey kids. Mm -hmm. I was one of those latchkey kids myself, but fortunately for us, our school was right across the street. I grew up in North Fort Gardens Apartments, which they now call City View Luxury Apartments. Those were projects, and I grew up in that potholes and things of that nature. Well, I used to walk right across the street there to North Fork Elementary School that wasn't a, a, a long distance, but I see some of these children walking, you know, to Rock Island Elementary School over there across uh, 19th Street right there, you know. Sometimes. So I got my blue light here. Right on, right on. Okay, let's 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 so, bring it on home. So, so, yeah. so, so mm -hmm. uh, brother Johnson, I gotta I gotta reflect with you on that because again, that village that we grew up in is is not always there anymore. But for those of us that still live in the community, I think it is it, noble that we try to uh, identify with what you were just saying about being present in our community when our kids are in the mornings going to school and midday coming home. Um, you know, I, I think it's important that we be accessible, that they get to see an image of a, of a responsible black man, whether it's quoted success or not, the fact that we're holding it down, we're holding down our households, we're maintaining our properties, and uh, we're out there actually representing and, and not only that, adhering to some of our kids. Because I know 
our kids in my neighborhood get a little rambunctious some some mm -hmm. afternoons when they come home from school. And it's important that uh, I see a lot of our seniors that are still around sitting out in their yards and, and saying, hey, boy, hey, y'all y'all cut that out now. We're not going to have that foolishness today. Y'all should have had a good day in school. Go home, do your homework. Oh, yeah. You know, that's the kind of stuff that kept us in line. Yes. yes. And it, 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 it hasn't failed us yet, I don't believe. And, and I think it's still necessary today. Anybody yeah, else? You know, know that, that, that how we got here is not only from a physical uh, standpoint, from a mental and a spiritual uh, point as well. The the and, and Emmanuel, you you mentioned uh, integration, and you said one way or another you have no comment. We were victims of integration, and I say victim because to me that's exactly what it was. We, we were we were we were uh, stripped from our from 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 our our unity and um, placed in 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 a predicament where. We are sitting next to people with, with, with money to, to, to dress and do what they want. And here we are with probably hand-me-downs or whatever. So, so right immediately, if we didn't have any self-esteem, what we had was killed. Mm -hmm. So if our parents didn't instill in us that we had to be better, we had to be better uh, you know, than, 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 than them, you know, um, yes, that's, you know, if I might interject a little bit on that, Bob, it's, uh, um, when we integrated us, the reason why it didn't benefit us because of the intent. They didn't include any intent to cover all races when they put us all in the same classroom to attend school. And I could use a military experience. Um, in the military, you will be in a platoon, a squad, a battalion with people from all parts of the world. And it was commanded and demanded and mandated that everyone will work together regardless mm -hmm. of ethnicity, your skin color, et cetera. Because when we go into battle, we all going to bleed red. Mm -hmm. So we had everything there in our trainings and everything that made sure everybody understood in their own way. So if we did do that for the military, why can't we do it as citizens in the United States? Because this country is the only country that's in the unique position to have someone from every other country within it. Mm -hmm. Most countries you go to, that country only contains people from that continent, that, that country. Mm -hmm. So you would think that America would be the example to the rest of the world. And when you look around, we actually are an example to the rest of the world. The wrong, the wrong, yeah, yeah, yeah. You know. mm -hmm. Yeah, let me just uh, go back to our dear sister, Miss Marion Williams. When we speak about that integration process and the school systems, obviously now we're full fledged into it. Uh, but what have been some of your experiences and how are you seeing our children adjust today? Well, before, before I share that, I, I do want to uh, share us. Um, I want to concur with Mr. Johnson, the fact that we have to do more than um, talk at it. We have to be ever present in our communities. Um, when, I, when I got married about 30 years ago, we bought a home right next to my parents' house, right in the 33311, right off Six Rock. Uh, most of our friends was like, you know, both of you guys are professionals. Why are you living in the hood? And I thought we thought it was necessary. Um, and not only that we were able to be homeowners and be house rich and not house poor, um, you know, we we wanted to be there. And I was coming home from work one day and I got out of my car and a little boy on the bicycle rolled by and he said, your boyfriend just left. I said, my boyfriend? He said, yeah, that man who lives with you. I said, you mean my husband? And he and he repeated the word, husband. <laughs> and I said, yes, he's my husband. He said, okay. And to this day, the young man has grown up, graduated high school, has a trade. He comes back and speaks to myself and my husband. And for him, just seeing a stable couple meant a lot. But I am fortunate because on my street, 21st, 22nd, and 23rd, a lot of the kids that grew up, we came back and bought homes on the block. And so we're right here together 
um, watching our neighborhood develop, but also being active to ensure that our older relatives are not pushed out. Um, and so when we talk about regionification, I think that we have to also be honest that a lot of our, um, our colleagues, our family, our friends quickly um, sold Big Mama House and, and moved on. Right. Um, a lot of times we own these properties and houses outright and we chose to sell. Um, and so right now we have to do whatever we can to reclaim what we have left. And I think that plays an important part um, when we talk about our schools. Now, I graduated from Dillard as well as my kids. Right. I do work for Broward County Schools. I could have put my kid in any school, but they went to Dillard. Because I knew at Dillard, um, and even though I do support uh, black student unions, right? But Dillard doesn't need a black student union. The whole school is designed to promote our students and build leaders, right? All, mm -hmm. all of my kids went to HBCUs because they understood how unique it is to, to, be, to look at them beyond their race. Um, and so when I the issue that we have in schools right now is kids who are looking to try to find themselves in a very complex situation, teachers who lack education about African and African American history, they don't value some of our kids. Um, we talk about discipline all the time. I get discipline records. It's not just white teachers who are consequencing our kids. A lot of them are our black teachers, consequence in our kids. Okay, so when we when we talk about some of the issues that we're having, it is definitely a disconnect. And I think that we're at a point now, and I really appreciate um, Mr. Henry for continually holding Broward County School accountable, continually putting up there and advocate because some of our parents will not and they don't know the power of a voice. But we can't see some of the changes, right? That already happened is because our community stood up and spoke out. And this is not the first go around with Broward County Schools. Going back to forcing, like you said, from a four, a four, um, a four month education to a 10 month education, the eventually graduating, black people have always had to fight Broward to get a, an adequate education because it's still not equal right and so we, we still have to work for that it's a big deficit we know it's a deficit and i think only through community can we reinforce and hold them accountable to make sure that we're giving all of our kids the same thing and and it, and it is a battle it's you know, a battle you know, you know, Miss 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 Williams, we had a conversation um, with uh, uh, Mr. Parker. And Mr. Parker, mm -hmm. he asked me. He said, uh, "Well, Bobby, you know, we 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 just some changes were just made uh, on the school board. What it what is it going to take for us to move forward? You know, and, and so both of us we we were thinking, and, and we all came. We both came up with the same thing." Remember the old school teaching? Mm -hmm. You know, remember when 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 teachers actually lived in your neighborhood or they knew you, they can put their hands on you? You know, so so that was one of the one of the answers. I'm not gonna say it was the only answer, but 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 we need to get back to the basics of what brought us to where we where we are now. We need to get back to the basics and we, and we don't we don't have it. So that I'm sorry. So we, that was just that. we 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 nah, have a lot of hurdles. Yeah. That's that's a that's a different conversation. Yeah, a different conversation. <laughs> you know, but in fact, I do we say that um, we we going to bring we going to bring somebody else in. We are going to make this thing real tight tonight, man. So y'all Y'all come on, tighten up, slide up, slide up. Man. All right, All right, start yeah. come, on, come on, we're gonna bring somebody on here. All right. Now, this gentleman here uh, has walked across the country. He's walked across the country to bring attention to human traffic. All right, and 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 wow. he has an anniversary okay. month coming up. So we're gonna we're gonna invite Mr. Roger DeHart to join us, man. So bring a chair and squeeze it in, man. We find us. We gonna find yeah, a spot because we live here at the old yeah. Dillard Museum. So, old Dillard Museum. So we wanna we wanna bring everybody in yeah. that we can and, and share this historic event tonight. Mm -hmm. 
Right. Yes, yes. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. All right. So speak up, Raj. What's happening, man? First of all, I'm a Dilla High School graduate. I'm looking at Coach Daryl Burroughs, Marcia Pender. Great memories, great memories, mm -hmm. great memories. Uh -huh. mm -hmm. But uh, again, um, Bobby, mm -hmm. uh, thanks so much for, you know, this is Westside is there special to me because my dad worked here part time years ago with, mm -hmm. with your dad. Mm -hmm. You know, so that that always like, mm -hmm. yeah, I always, my mom always reminds me of that, you know, but um, so um, I, um, I'm an advocate for victims and survivors of human trafficking. So the last few years I've been doing walks all over the country to raise awareness. And this year is a special year because um, it's gonna make five years since I did a walk from Fort Lauderdale to Washington, D.C. And so um, March 31st, I'm going to be uh, hitting uh, New York City. It's going to be a small walk, but it's going to be at Central Park, you know, a, a significant uh, landmark. And, you know, I'm welcome, anyone's welcome to come. It's going to be about three or four miles, and we're just going to be raising awareness for victims all over the world. I chose New York City because, you know, New York City is kind of like the spot. You know what I mean? And so um, it'd be great anyone can come. And like I said, it's going to be a, a fun time, and we're really going to be um, being a voice for those that's hurting and those that's in vulnerable situations. So uh, thanks for allowing me to, to share about that because this, that, that means a lot to me, mm -hmm. you know? Yeah, yeah. You, from, from, from the, the screening tonight of the uh, Taking Innocence, mm -hmm. uh, I saw you I saw you in that movie, man. Uh, what did that mean to you? It, the emotions, the first emotions that came to mind was, man, I'm so undeserving of this. As I'm on stage with these young ladies, most of them had been trafficked. You know, most of them had been taken advantage of, and I'm like, you know, so those, those are the real heroes right there. I'm just that guy who's just trying to be more of a, a, a ally uh, for them. And so being on that stage, I felt very humble and grateful. Mm -hmm. I really did, mm -hmm. you know? Mm -hmm. Yeah. R Raj, I just want to ask if any, your, your takeaway, if you just want to share with our viewing audience, what would, would have been your takeaway from what we had an opportunity to view tonight? My, I think for me, the, the biggest takeaway is this is one of those causes that you don't want to just leave here and say, oh, it's a great, great event. Mm -hmm. You know, it's got to be something that that you wrestle in your mind and see, okay, where can I, where can I fit in with this? You know, because you, because you know, I just chose walking because you know, it, it, walking is easy. You, you know what I'm saying? So I think um, what I, the most important thing is seeing those ladies on stage. They looking to us to do something. You know what I mean? Not change the whole world. Just try to change one life at a time. You know, because they, they crying out for men to do their God-given roles and, and protect. Mm. Mm -hmm. Brother Johnson, I want to ask you the same question. How did we get here? Mm -hmm. The question was, after the viewing tonight, what was your biggest takeaway from what we saw? Uh, yeah, the fact that the, those who were supposed to be protecting uh, the women made it clear that most of the uh, ones who were victimizing were men. And it really made me feel a little, some kind of way because, you know, I look at my own, I have two children, my own, one son and one daughter. And, you know, and I, I heard uh, the guy or the other gentleman that was on stage there, the guy's in national law enforcement, uh, he spoke highly of teaching his family how to defend themselves. And I, I said, I do the same thing for fear that I know that I can't be there all the time. And I just, you know, the hair standing up on my on the back of my neck, you know, just thinking about those ladies and saying that, you know, how she got thrown in the room with this grown man, mm -hmm. you know, knowing that she was a 13 year old girl, you know, to violate her. It's like, mm -hmm. darn man, there's a million men around. Why could just one more right. a man that got his right mind could not have been there that day? You know? mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. How did we get here? How did we get here? Yeah, I, I know it's, this is Black History Month, and we're 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 discussing some things, you know, not necessarily, but it's all Black history. Mm -hmm. So it, there is a connection. Mm -hmm. So I mean, I know I know David. When we were talking about putting this program together, we we, we didn't necessarily want to, to deal with the middle the middle pack passage. But there's no way in the world we can get around it. You know, the atrocities uh, that happened to us, 
uh, is now it seems like it's happening, you know, for to everybody, in one form of one form or, or, or another. If, you know, when we when we talk about the little passage and, and that aspect of it, you know, the the, the profit that was earned there, the profit that was gained there was, was astronomical. Look, America, they got America. And, and, and I'll be I'll, I'll be remiss if I didn't say that at some point that the, the, the conversation of rep, reparation has to be continued, yeah. has to be talked out. Mm-hmm. But what we're seeing now in modern day is a, a, at the same level. When we when we hear some of the Epstein stories and the, the mm-hmm. monies that they amass and the, mm-hmm. the level of the people that are involved mm-hmm. with the trafficking and the type of income and money they have to just buy people, mm-hmm. uh, you know, there's a, a correlation there. Mm-hmm. And, uh, you know, at some point, I think we really have to just really dig deep mm-hmm. and, and just say, how long? Yeah. Manuel, in your, in your, in your, 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 your digging up, your, your uncovering, um, uh, so any ugliness? Oh, man. You know, I mean, it's just, and I, I mean, right now, I mean, we could go in the room of the gallery, the, the, the Chambers trial. You know, this was to be the first death penalty case in Broward County where four young black boys were beaten and starved into a confession for a murder that did not commit. And that was also Thurgood Marshall's first Supreme Court case. And that was down here in Broward County. So when we hear about like Miranda rights, it's really your Chambers rights. Because that the, the, the Chambers trial predates the Miranda trial, mm. and we talk about lynching. We hear about Reuben Stacy a lot, but in 1948, there was a man in Fort Lauderdale by the name of Daniel Webster McNair. And in 1948, they found his body at the New River in Fort Lauderdale mm. with a sledgehammer and a rope tied around his neck. Mm. And his death was labeled as a suicide. But in the death, the death certificate, it is it is noted that his death was by strangulation. And through the research, he was actually a laborer, so he was getting contracts for uh, black folks to work. So you know, uh, when they labeled his death as a suicide, his family wasn't able to reap any benefits. Wow. So there's all kind of um, crazy stories that happen here in Broward County. And um, you know, we got to uncover the truth so that we can be able to move forward in a healthy way. Yeah, yeah. So, so uncovering the truth and being able to present the truth. Miss Williams, we got a governor, mm. uh, you know, uh, uh, that's trying his best to whitewash and 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 fight out uh, any any of our, our history any of our, any of the truth you know so how do you deal with that miss williams she froze i definitely Okay, to know it. that we do have a law requiring the teaching of African African American history. Do not allow the governor rhetoric, his comments being sensationalized and grabbing headlines to take us away from our task. Um, I did a training with teachers the other night and I went over the law, the mandate underneath this governor and this commissioner of education policy 1003.42 that requires us to teach our history and so we're in a situation where the governor makes statements and then he uh, but he doesn't there's black there are many action steps there's lawsuits every day against this governor about attempting to uh, to um, ban books what we have to do is to hold accountable as the law exists and I tell the teachers, when you are fearful of not teaching, that means you're not following what you're required to do. And when parents don't demand seeing this in their kids' um, homework and content, that is where we have to hold them accountable as well. We know that there are people that prefer not to talk about our history, but we also got to be careful when we're looking at the little taglines. Like he'll often bring up the 1619 project and he'll try to use that as a way to say we're not teaching the 1619 project. If you look at the history of the 1619 project, it is a series of essays based on historical sites. 
it was never intended to be a curriculum. So he's very strategic at where he is pointing his 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 laser at to make everyone fearful that it is illegal to teach his history in the state of Florida. And that is incorrect. He'll make a statement today and then a week later a statement will come out to say what you're supposed to to be teaching. He holds the term critical race theory doesn't have anything to do with pedagogy. The um, crucial area of understanding what he's saying and then what is the law requiring. So how do we manage this? We manage this by continually trying to reinforce this with our teachers. We look forward to the new administrators who are coming in to clarify this with our teachers um, because recently it's been very quiet. No one is willing to explain what the law is and what our teachers are supposed to be doing. The only thing they hear are the statements that our governor is making. And even when it came to the African American History AP course, um, there was a lot of back and forth about the content of that course, even when it goes to the people who originally wrote the course to what the course was released, right? So we gotta be mindful that we don't really get too caught up into what he's saying, but make sure that we keep it immediate and personal when it comes to educating our kids. Okay, you know, the, and, and I hate to be the bearer of bad news, but time is running out, <laughs> you know. So, but Ms. Williams, we got to have you back, uh, and I think we need to do it next month when we bring some some school board people on and mm -hmm. just chat up and have a, and have a conversation uh, about this. So if we can go around in one minute, gentlemen, uh, what do we do to get from this point? You know, uh, Lester, we'll start with you. Get from this point. First of all, it's going to have to be like, I, I just have to revert back to Ronald the King's uh, uh, statement and his uh, sermon on the March on Washington for Jobs and Equality that we know as the I Have a Dream speech. He says he had a dream that one day little white boys and little black boys, little white girls, little black girls would be able to sit down together at the table of brotherhood. Mm -hmm. And if you do not allow people to come together and learn about each other's history, mm -hmm. all history is going to be destroyed. Yeah, that's right. Okay. That's right. Mr. DeHart? Um, I think if we remember who we are, we're the chosen ones by God. Mm -hmm. Black people, we're the chosen ones mm -hmm. by God. If we can just be confident in that, no matter where we are right now, mm -hmm. God will help us, unite us, and you know, once we get united, they, they ain't a force of lies that can stop us. But the battle for us is getting united. But prior to that, we gotta remember who we are. Collectively, we have the black people and all things are possible. Ms. Williams? I, can, I concur with that. I, I think that sometimes we don't realize how we are. Um, I look at the history here in Broward how far we have um, be able to achieve as a collective group of people. And we got to continue that journey. Um, no matter what obstacles are put in front of us, I think that we have to face them and when, other, and when possible to be able to advocate for others when they can't advocate for themselves. Mm -hmm. Mr. George. All right. I was just um, I would say just really being consistent, you know, like to stay consistent with what, with what you're doing. And then also just, um, you know, bridging the gap between the elders and the youth, because it's really important to, again, document your history. You know, we're losing elders. Cost of living is rising. Gentrification is happening. So these are all layers of things that's. Uh, allowing us to, well, that's causing us to wipe away our history. So we really got to just to stay consistent on that. And um, yeah, that would be a, uh, my call. Oh, yeah, also I would say too, sorry, I'll try to get my, my, I'm sorry, uh, my train of thoughts. But um, also, 
just the um, same way we look at politics, the same way we look at politics and how we got to focus on the local aspect of politics, it's the same thing we got to look at when it comes to history. Mm-hmm. You know, local history is very important and know who your, these streets are named after, know what these buildings used to be, and just really emphasize on learning you know, your local black history in your backyard. Because you will see that some of the local black history does tie into the global aspect of things as well. Well, you know, being here in the old Dillon Museum, it, it's important that we understand the importance of knowledge, the importance of an education. So in my opinion, knowledge is still the key. Life is a school. And it doesn't necessarily mean you get all of your learning and your education in the four walls of a classroom, but it's truly important to understand who you are, whose you are, and where you're going. So I'm gonna leave it right there, my brother, and pass it on the Man, that was that was that was a lot. Y'all. Everybody, everybody put in what we need to to do to get away from from where we are. And 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 from 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 Lester to standing up to be a man from Roger talking about who we are as a people, Miss Williams from the educational standpoint, Mr. George from all of the knowing the knowledge of what each of these pieces stand for. And and Brother David, you you putting it all together with, with the glue that binds, that, that love, that's all that it is. From the book of Deuteronomy, the law, when Moses was saying, was said to, when he said, you turn your back on your first love. When you, when you went away from your first love, and that was the creator, our father, when we turn our backs on him, all of this came into play. So in order for us to get back to where we're supposed to be, we got to turn back to him. And in doing that, I think we'll find everything we need to bring everybody together, not just black people, because all skin ain't kin, <laughs> but everybody, everybody with one love. So those of you who listen tonight and who joined us, please join us again next week. Uh, we're going to do it all over again with another topic. We're going to open March up with some truly, uh, perhaps some nerve wrecking, uh, raising eyebrows, and making some people mad. But we got to stir it up to do it. In order for the farmer to get crop, he has to break the ground. So we're going to create some friction. And hopefully, by doing that, we'll, we'll bring us together. So good night, everybody. Thank you, everybody, for joining us and allowing us to come live from here. Mr. Parker, thank you. God bless you all. Good night.